Hey guys, welcome back. We're now in chapter 1.6. Physical change. A change in the state of matter represents a physical change. During a physical change, you can change the shape of something. You can change it from a liquid to a solid, a solid to a gas, any of those kind of changes. But what you're changing is just the state or the physical shape of something. Um, for example, if you have an ice cube and you break that ice cube in half, you have ice on both sides of that, right? You haven't changed the water in the ice at all. It's water in, on the left-hand piece of ice. It's water on the right-hand piece of ice. You let that ice melt. It goes from being solid water to liquid water. You boil that water. It goes from being liquid water to gaseous water. But nothing has changed about the water. This is a physical change. You're changing the physical state or the physical shape of the, the water or whatever you're dealing with, okay? Those are physical changes. Chemical changes, on the other hand, uh, result in a change of the chemical identity of a substance. When a substance undergoes such a change, it is referred to as a chemical reaction, okay? Now, the best example I can give everyone of a, a chemical change is silver. Now, we all have seen beautiful old silver sets at museums. And they're not gray. They're kind of either they're greenish or they have some white in them or even sometimes some black in them. What that is is a chemical reaction of the silver. Silver is a gray, shiny metal. That's what silver is. Silver tea sets, on the other hand, the, the really nice ones that you see in museums, they're not silver. They have what's called patina on them. And that patina is silver tarnish. And silver tarnish is not gray. Well, wait a minute now. What's happening? Well, the silver is undergoing a chemical change. It's going from being the element, the metal silver, and it's becoming a compound. Some sil uh, silver oxide, silver sulfides, um, silver something else. You know, S Silver is reacted with something, changing the color of the silver. So when you do a chemical change, you change what the substance is. You went from silver, a shiny metal, to silver sulfide, let's say, which is not a shiny metal. It's kind of a dull appearance to it, but it gives it a nice color. Isn't that interesting? Now here we're showing a photograph of a charcoal barbecue. Charcoal is black and it's flammable. When you burn it, when you undergo the chemical reaction, charcoal becomes white or grayish ash that is not flammable. So you've changed the chemical identity of the charcoal. Pretty neat, huh? Now, in chemistry, we talk to each other in terms of symbology. We talk to each other in terms of symbolism. Now, we use what's called a chemical equation to do that. The chemical equation is a very, very beautiful thing. It is a concise way of telling you what's happening in a chemical reaction. It's a beautiful thing. Every chemical equation has an arrow. They all have an arrow, and that arrow is very important. Okay, So the arrow's there, and the arrow's down here, actually. Okay, They have an arrow. On the left-hand side of this arrow are reactants. On the right-hand side of the arrow are the products. Sometimes you'll hear me say starting material, which is another a slang jargon way of saying reactants. The proper name for the material on the left-hand side of the arrow is reactants. That's the proper name. Every now and then you'll hear people say starting material. That's slang. It's a chemical jargon. Okay. Now, what's happening here in this chemical equation is carbon is reacting with oxygen. These are my reactants. They're reacting to form carbon dioxide. Okay. That's how I know that's true because on the left hand side, those are my reactants, is what I'm mixing together. And on the right-hand side of the arrow is what I'm getting from that reaction. And, of course, over the arrow is written the word heat. Because we have to add a... Oops, that's not doing what I want it to do. We have to add a little bit of heat to this in order to get the reaction to go. Now, this is the barbecue reaction. This is the charcoal barbecue. Charcoal is essentially carbon. It's reacting with the oxygen in the air to give us carbon dioxide and a whole bunch of heat. So you can, fry up your, you can barbecue up your food. Now... There's also this letter that's written here in parentheses. Let me get a different color here, guys. 
in parentheses right there. There's that letter there, and then there's a letter over here too. Those letters are the state of matter. That's telling me what state the matter is in when I'm doing the reaction. So this is telling me that my carbon is in the solid form, S for solid, uh, is reacting with oxygen in the gaseous form, G is for gas, and it's giving me CO2 in the gas state. All right? Now there's also L for liquid, and there's also this one called AQ. AQ stands for aqueous or dissolved in water. Okay? So in this reaction, one carbon reacted with two, well, one oxygen molecule, CO, or O2, pardon me, to give us CO2. And that's the, that's the question. Pretty cool, huh? That's very concise. Every chemist in the world can read that and know exactly what it means without saying a word. Isn't that great? What a great science. Balancing equations. Now, this is probably one of the more fun things we're going to do in this class. I think, I think everyone kind of likes doing this because it's kind of a game. It's a little puzzle. Balancing equations. Now, you have to understand something called the law of conservation of mass. The law of conservation of mass says that matter only changes form. So the amount of matter in the reactant side and the product side must be the same. Now, matter is basically, but well, basically how I learned the law is matter is not created, matter is not destroyed, matter is interconverted. So this matter can become that matter. Okay? So keep that in mind. The stuff on the left must be the stuff on the right. Now, they're going to have different bonds. They're going to have different chemical properties. But whatever I had on the left, I also have to have on the right in the same proportion. Pretty neat, eh? Hmm. Now, we're going to do this thing called balancing equations. Now, in order to do that, we're going to have to, well, why don't I just show you? Before I get there, you're going to, have, you're going to be adding numbers to the front of things. So these numbers we're going to be writing in are called coefficients. Okay? Coefficients are the numbers, or basically the multiplier numbers we're going to put into these equations to balance them. And that'll make a lot more sense when I show it to you, okay? So let's just do an example. Say I want you to balance this equation. I want you to put the same amount of mass on the left as you put on the right. The same amount of matter on the left as is on the right, okay? So right now, in front of every one of these symbols, compounds or whatnot, is the number one. So one aluminum, one sulfur, gives me one Al2S3. It's called aluminum sulfide. Now, remember the law of conservation of mass says I have to have the same amount of matter on the left as the, as the matter I have on the right. has to be the same. Okay. So right now, if I were to do this out, I have one aluminum and I have one sulfur on the left. Now, over here on the right, I have two aluminums. Now, how did I get two? One times two. One times two. And I have one times three. Oops, excuse me. Let me change that. Uh, three. There we go. So on the right-hand side of this equation, I have three sulfur, three S. How do I know? One, oops, what did I do that for? One times three. So whatever number is up here, you multiply by that number, and that's the number of aluminums. Whatever number is right here, you multiply by 3, and that's the number of sulfur. Are you with me so far? So if I had a, for example, this is not, don't, uh, don't write this down in your notes or anything, guys. I'm just going to show you something. I want you to see this. Let's say for argument's sake, now this is not going to be right, but this is for argument's sake. Let's say I put a 3 there. Well, that would mean on the right-hand side, I had 3 times 2 aluminum. That would be 6. If I had 3 times 3 sulfur, that would be 9. Okay? That's how this is working. But that's not right. Now, we don't want to do that for this question. Now, for some questions, that may be right. For this one, I don't think it will be. Okay? Now, all we're allowed to do is change the coefficient in front of each chemical symbol. You cannot change these numbers ever. You cannot put numbers here. Never, never, never put numbers there ever. Don't ever change the chemical symbol ever. Do not change the chemical symbols ever. Because if you do, you're making either the question very, very easy or very, very hard, and it's always wrong. Okay? All you can do 
is put numbers in front. That's all you're allowed to do. Change the coefficient. So let's see how we do it. We have aluminum. We have sulfur. I like to list my elements down the center. Times 1, times 1, times 2, times 3. So now, we are definitely not balanced. We are out of balance. So we have to balance the equation. Okay? Well, all I'm allowed to do is put numbers in front, right? That's it. That's all I'm allowed. So let's put the number 2 here. Now, if I do that, I have 2 aluminum now. 2 times the imaginary number 1 is right there. 2 times 1. So I have 2 aluminum. And if I put the magic number 3 here, I'll have 3 sulfur on the left. Hmm. That seems like it's balanced now. Let's take a look. 2 aluminum. 1. Remember, there's, no, there's an imaginary 1 here. 1 times 2. 2 aluminum. 3 sulfur. 1 times 3. Th oops, get on the camera. 3 sulfur. So that's balanced. This equation is now mass balanced. Okay, we've not violated the law of conservation of mass. Let's balance these two. Now let's, these are, there's two of them here, so it's going to be a little bit tough. Hmm, well, let's go with the first one. So let's, let's list the things down here. Aluminum, iron, and oxygen. Oh, wow, tough question. I think we can handle it, though. We have one aluminum on the left. We have one iron on the left. We have one oxygen on the left. On the right, we have one iron. We have two aluminum. We have three oxygen. Oh boy, oh boy. Well, here's my general rule for balancing equations. I look for what I call standalone elements. See how that aluminum is by himself? See how this iron is by himself? They're there all by their lonesome. They're not bothering anybody. So now, I would leave those till the end. They're not involved in a compound. There's no nothing else with this iron. There's nothing else with that aluminum. Leave them till the end. If you wait till the very end to balance those two, this is a very easy question. If you try to balance them like right now, you'll never get it right. Well, you might, but it'll take you a lot longer. Okay? So that only leaves me with the oxygen. I'm going to balance the oxygen first. I have three on the right, so I'm going to put a number three right there. Remember, you can only put numbers in front. You cannot put numbers in the formula. You may not change the formula. Bang. Okay? So that means I have now, if we do the counting again, I have three iron and three oxygen. How is that? Well, three times one is three iron. Three times one oxygen is three oxygens on the left. Notice now the oxygens are balanced. The irons are not. Well, let's balance them. Put a 3 right there. Now notice, by putting a 3 there in front of that iron on the right, it doesn't change anything else. It just changes the iron. So now the irons are balanced. So let's balance the aluminum. Ha! Huh, cool. 2 aluminum. 2 aluminum. 3 Fe. 3 Fe. 3 times three, 1 is 3 oxygens. And that's how you balance that question. Now, I make everything look easy because I've been doing this a long time. What you need to do is take this question off, turn the computer, put it on, like darken the screen or something. Work this out on your own. Make sure you can do it. That's not a hard question, but it is impossible if you've never tried it before. Okay? On exam, you don't want this to be the first time you see this. Okay? You make sure you can do it. All right? All right. Let's make some room here. Oops. Let me see if I can erase all this stuff. There we go. Oh, yeah. This will take for a minute. You know, so in the time we have together, we can just talk about the weather or something. There we go. Wish I could make this tip a little bigger. Maybe I can. Hold on. Nope. Can't. This is well thought out. Well, you get the idea. It's kind of like writing on a blackboard. You just had some, some remnants left over. All right. Let's not belabor this anymore. All right. Now we're going to balance the bottom equations. We have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Three carbon, eight hydrogen. Man, the numbers are getting big now. Look out. Two oxygen. We have one carbon, two hydrogens, and uh oh, we have oxygen in two different compounds, don't we? Okay, well, add them up. 
Don't don't let it scare you. Just add them up. Two oxygens here plus one oxygen there is three oxygens right there. Now, remember I said before, if you have a standalone element, balance it last. Oxygen all by itself. O2 all by itself. If I put any number I want right here, it's not going to affect anything else. So leave that O2 to the end. Don't balance oxygen to the bitter end. Trust me. And the only reason I'm saying to do that is because oxygen is by itself. It's by itself. So balance carbon and hydrogen first. So on the left-hand side, I have three carbon. Three carbon. I just balanced the carbon. Here I have eight hydrogen and two hydrogen. So put a four right there. Four times two is eight. I balance the carbon, balance the hydrogen, leaving the oxygen till the end because it's a standalone element. Easy as pie. Okay? Okay. Now, how many oxygens do we have? Well, three times two is six, plus four times one is four, 10. We have 10 total oxygens on the right. So that's gonna be a 10 right there. Well, if we wanna make 10 on the left, we put a five right there. Okay? Now, that's a tough question. That's a tough question. Doesn't mean you can't do it. Doesn't mean it won't be on the exam. It's just a tough question. Now, notice how I followed the rule. Leave the standalone element till the end. There won't always be a standalone, but if there is, that's the one you wait for. Just wait till the end. It will be okay. I promise. And that, my, my friends, is the end of chapter one. And I'm glad that you were able to survive to this point with me. I really do appreciate that. And we'll, we'll see you in chapter two. Good luck. Good chemistry.